Sure, what the land use ordinance is. A little bit of history on that. On the town website, there's actually a history of Berwick zoning. Berwick did not have zoning until about 1991. And it was actually a site plan review ordinance was put in in 1986. It was repealed and then put back in. It was a very controversial time. There was uh, articles in the newspaper, no zoning, yes zoning, everything in between. And it was done because um, the, there was a proposal for a landfill to come into the town. And the planning board really had no legal standing on, 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 on imposing conditions or anything like that. So right around that same time, there's this thing called the growth uh, management laws for the state of Maine. And right around the 90s, the state of Maine incentivized towns and cities to create comprehensive plans. And at that time, there was also regional planning organizations. We still use the same regional planning office today, Southern Maine Planning Development Commission. And over those times, they created model land use ordinances. And if you, at, and that's kind of, you, you take that template, which, in, which has about 12 different chapters, and it covers different things. It has definitions. It has the, it, it establishes the zone. It has different nuisance standards, I'd call them. There's different performance. So the nuisance standards are things like noise, smell it has now, um, visual impacts, things, things like that. And then there's different articles, Article 7, 8 in that range, I think it's 8, have specific standards to specific uses. So in the land use ordinance table, where it's literally just a table that's about six pages long, and it has the different zones in the columns, and it has the different uses in the rows, and they're either X's or C's, and if it's a C, that means it goes through planning board. And then on, in then Article 8, we'll further go into what requirements it needs. Any conditional use requires that set of, of standards. Every conditional use has to meet these different standards, whether we have the, enough resources to allow the use, water resources, and everywhere from uh, water, so if wetlands are disturbed, Oftentimes, it's done through DEP, where if you're disturbing the wetland, you need to create a new wetland over here, new ditching, riprap, things like that, different stormwater infrastructure that oftentimes ends up treating the, the property, and the, the property can be better off even with development. It's getting to that point. Um, so what it is, at first, it started kind of out as a model ordinance that a lot of towns adopted, and it's a living document. You might have noticed that we are amending it almost every chance that we can get, which is two times a year, three max, because we have m mostly two meetings per year, and the amendments are done through um, a pretty extensive engagement process. How the ordinance gets changed and amended can be done through a few different ways. You, the citizen, can initiate, and that a lot of the times it actually happens that way, where a complaint or you point something out in the ordinance and go, that doesn't really make sense for Berwick. And as a staff, I or the code enforcement officer will go, you're right, that doesn't make sense. You know, let's propose it to the planning board. The planning board will consider it. Um, a lot of times I'll agree with the resident and maybe I'll bring it to planning board and the planning board has a different op opinion and they go, no, this is the reason why we've came to this decision on why this ordinance is the way it is. Or they go, yep, that totally makes sense. And we create this uh, ongoing document for a couple months and then it's, it's put to a public hearing where uh, we'll, uh, we'll invite the public if a lot of times, like I said, it's initiated by public. So they'll come in and kind of explain why they want it amended or maybe why they don't want it amended because it can affect their, their neighborhood. Right, so the comprehensive plan and how it ties in with the ordinances. So we can't have any land use ordinances without it matching the comprehensive plan. 
if it's challenged in court, then it, it won't, it'll be thrown out because it has to meet the town's comprehensive plan. Everything that's in the land use ordinance boils down from policies, goals, strategies, data, charts, things like that. And they're done, they're done for a specific reason. So for example, that's why in the R3 zone, we don't allow certain things and we have a larger minimum lot size requirement. Um, and maybe we, maybe we want to increase that minimum lot size requirement or we want to limit the permits or we want to incentivize tree growth or we want to, um, there are, probably 25 different strategies that a town can do to direct growth in a certain way. In a town, you want to direct growth because it's with infrastructure. If you're running roads all the way throughout town, the per person cost exponentially goes up. So if you have, you know, you have thousands of people who use Sullivan Street right here in front of the town hall versus someone else in a, in a rural area, the per person cost is just cut and in, in, into so many different directions, it becomes affordable. So that's, that's, that's really the, the crux of what the Growth Management Act is all about, is keeping the growth, keeping the economic development in a centralized manner and protecting the natural resources in our rural areas. So every application goes through this process of starts with me where they'll come in, is it allowed in the zone? It's a very on the surface thing. And then as you dig into the details, you weigh those options. So when the when an applicant comes in, the actual application has check boxes on it that correlate to the exact standards. And for someone to get on planning board, they have they have to meet they have to have a complete application because if they go to the planning board and they don't have a complete application, the board is going to ask me, what are they, what are they doing there? So that's, that, that's the first step. So there's been questions about commercial uses in residential zones. Now, every zone in Berwick is mixed use to a certain extent. It goes from, so probably the RCI district is the most relaxed district because that is where we put our industrial uses. Those are the most high intensive and, and the, the biggest uses that could cause the most nuisances all the way up through to our resource protection, protection districts, which are wetlands or water bodies and things like that. So there's a whole spectrum of uses that are, are allowed. R3 is another one that it's all, it's restricted for any use, residential or commercial, because those are where our, our most precious natural resources are. So there was a, a question about a use in the R2 zone. There are 40 plus different commercial uses that are allowed in the R2 zone. The R2 zone's name is transitional residential. It's probably not the best name. That's just what the name has been since the implementation of the comprehensive plan. But uh, since the um, beginning of that zone, commercial uses have been allowed. There's commercial uses allowed in just about every zone in Berwick. Mm -hmm.